Yeah, thank you all for allowing me to present uh, another work from uh, Carolina's Medical Center. Um, the title of this talk will be Delayed Primary Closure of the Skin and Subcutaneous Tissues Following Complex Contaminated Abdominal Wall Reconstruction, a Propensity Match Study. These are our disclosures as previously mentioned. So background, in high-risk patient populations, as many as 40% of patients um, can go on to develop uh, hernia after laparotomy. It's hernia repair is the fifth most common uh, procedure performed by young general surgeons in this country. And wound complications are inevitably, uh, will arise after ventral hernia repair and quite common. Um, they're important because that they can increase the risk for hernia failure um, three to five times. Contaminated abdominal wall reconstruction poses a particular challenge. Um, contaminated abdominal wall reconstruction can occur in the setting of a fistula, a mesh infection, an ostomy takedown, and these patients have wound complication rates reported in literature of up to six and 10. Um, and so our goal at CMC was to really focus on prevention of these wound complications. So delayed primary closure is a technique for uh, mitigating uh, the risk of um, contaminated wounds from uh, preventing uh, infection. It dates back to the First World War um, and has been used in a variety of fields, including orthopedics, uh, gynecology, and various um, subspecialties in general surgery. The mechanism for this is a decrease in bacteria in the wound bed um, and increased perfusion to the tissues. So we, uh, prospect, we queried our uh, prospectively maintained single institution database um, to select for patients that underwent open ventral hernia repair followed by a delayed primary closure. Um, we did exclude a subset of patients, um, those that uh, had a paniculectomy at the time of their ventral hernia repair, um, and those that went uh, delayed primary closure greater than seven days um, from the uh, time of the index operation. And our goal was really to target a delayed closure within four to six days. Primary outcomes were wound complication rate um, and the need for reopening of the incision. And then we propensity matched uh, to a non-DPC group of contaminated and dirty patients um, to provide a more apt comparison. So after you achieve fascial closure, there are three options of the way we see it um, for closure. You can close the skin at the time of the operation. Um, secondly, you can use a negative pressure wound vac therapy, much the same way as delayed primary closure. This uh, decreases the amount of exudate in the wound, decreases the bacteria. This was actually our kind of old approach to um, managing contaminated wounds, but we found that it took 127 days for these patients to completely heal the wounds. Um, after hernia repair, which is quite a burden to the patient, and then delayed primary closure. So for our technique, we decided to do a vac-assisted delayed primary closure. So at the time of the operation, we'd close the fascia, place a subcutaneous vac, um, and then do bedside debridements every uh, couple of days, and then return to the OR at anywhere from four to six days on average um, to perform a delayed primary closure. So there are 110 patients that met criteria. This is a very comorbid group of patients. Uh, nearly three in 10 were diabetic and smokers. The size of the defect was quite impressive too, almost 200 uh, centimeters uh, squared. Um, other things to note is that biologic mesh was uh, used in all instances where mesh was used and uh, prepared needle um, placement of the mesh as is uh, common at our institution was where we uh, placed the mesh. So we used a CEDAR uh, application to predict wound complication rate in this subset of populations and using that, two thirds of patients were predicted to have wound complications, uh, which is quite impressive and even more so than the number that I quoted earlier. So on average, only 1.2 uh, VAC changes were performed at bedside prior to closure and at mean time to closure was five days. Uh, the length of stay for these patients was nine days. So the primary outcome, the wound complication rate is 26.4%. Um, without having the propensity match subgroup, um, we know that the predicted wound complication rate was nearly 40% greater than that. And then 5% uh, of patients only required a re reopening of the wound. And for those patients that required a reopening of the wound, um, they received a subcutaneous vac uh, for management of uh, their open wound. Following propensity match, we had 70 patients in each group um, that uh, underwent DPC or uh, did not receive a DPC. Um, again, you can uh, see that most of these wounds were uh, contaminated. Um, notably, uh, the percent of patients receiving component separation was higher in the delayed primary closure group, which is why the predicted risk for wound complication, as you can see, was higher in the delayed primary closure group. So. 
Um, again, prepared neal, biologic mesh, uh, most common, um, very complex operations that took a considerable amount of time. And uh, incisional vac, that refers to a vac being applied at the time of closure, no difference between the two groups. And so these are our primary outcomes uh, for the propensity match subgroups. We have wound complication rates uh, that were uh, nearly double in the uh, non-DPC group. And then reopening of the wound was four times higher um, in the non-DPC group than the DPC group. So this is having substantial quality of life on our patient population for patients that um, failed DPC and required a reopening of the wound or uh, non-DPC management. And this is just, again, a little bit uh, more in detail. Uh, superficial wound breakdown was the most common uh, discrepancy between the DPC and non-DPC groups. Um, and then uh, I think it is important um, and, uh, to acknowledge that length of stay uh, was not different uh, between the two groups. Most of these patients stay in the hospital for several days, and a lot of this is uh, due to return of GI function. Um, and so a follow-up was achieved, uh, as you can see there. So uh, in conclusion, we want to get uh, from the picture on the left to the picture on the right successfully and prevent complications, which will therefore decrease recurrence and uh, need uh, to interact with the healthcare system. So DPC was used in a safe fashion, uh, decreases risk of wound complications and did so in a propensity match subgroup compared to patients that were not getting DPC at the time of closure. And it can spare a need for long-term VAC therapy, and we believe that this is, uh, uh, should be the standard of care uh, in, in uh, patients with a CDC class three and four wounds um, who are at high risk for developing wound complications. Um, limitations to this study is that a lot of times uh, in clinic is when we plan to do a delayed primary closure. This uh, study did not capture patients uh, for where it was not performed at all. Um, we have a uh, limited number of surgeons that were included in this study. It was four, um, which is the amount in our division. Um, and then lastly, there are potentially other methods uh, for, you know, uh, that could work on this high-risk population, uh, such as uh, using an incisional vac, which has not been studied specifically in contaminated wounds. Um, thank you all for allowing me to present uh, this work. Uh, take any questions at this time.